I'm Joe Kane. I'm Dan Kane. I'm Sal Kanka. And this is the Imperfect Podcast. Don't forget to check us out at hecklercane.com and download our episodes for free on iTunes and SoundCloud. To the bumper. So tonight, we talked with never-ending story icon Tammy Stronach. She is the childlike empress from the never-ending story, and it's just an iconic movie in general. I mean, I was a huge fan. I watched it recently, not even knowing I was doing this interview, and she, after being on and chatting with her for about a half hour, she's just super delightful. Yeah. I mean... She's she's a cool person. She's got lots of cool stories, um, you know, and... We butcher some of them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we talked to her about her parents being Indiana Jones and, uh, you know, her hitchhiking Hit- to auditions and, and all that and fun stuff. And hitchhiking to bars at 10 years old. And- <laughs> <laughs> yes. Tammy's going to love this when she hears the playback. And yeah. uh, we had a really good laugh with her and her personality is super sweet. And, you know, her personality, uh, I think, really... Uh, shines through when she talks about her company that she started called the Paper Canoe Company, um, which is creating family-friendly content um, of all sorts. Let's talk to Tammy. Tammy, welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Awesome. You're a fellow New Yorker, so we're happy to have somebody in the tri-state joining us. We've had a few others. Usually, you know, we got people calling in from L.A. and Texas and all over the place, so good to have a fellow New Yorker here. But I know you were born outside the U.S., and uh, when did you come over? When did you come to the U.S.? Uh, Well, I was born in uh, Tehran, Iran. My father is a Scottish archaeologist, and my mother is an Israeli archaeologist. Oh, wow. So they met uh, there on a dig site, and I grew up in Iran on excavations looking for old Zoroastrian artifacts. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's kind of interesting. I mean, that's like your parents were like Indiana Jones. Yeah, I was just going to say <laughs> that. <laughs> they really weren't. <laughs> just tell people they are. Tell people can, they are. You can think that. <laughs> It was really much more boring. It's like finding one little pottery shard and like using a toothbrush to like take it out. It's three days and it's this big celebration. But, um, but yes, they loved it. And um, and then after the revolution of seventy nine, we bounced around the globe a bit uh, till we found home in the U S. Uh, and eventually settled in uh, the Bay Area in San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, okay. So your first experience was in California. And I believe, uh, if I read correctly, you were taking some acting classes when you were there in California. Is that, is that how it went? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was, um, I was dancing and acting kind of throughout my childhood. And, um, and in California, there's a wonderful acting school in San Francisco called Amata. And I used to take singing classes and acting classes there, um, and I was also in ballet recitals, so that was my world as a kid. Mm -hmm. And was that something that you pursued on your own, or did your parents kind of push you that way, or were you just like came out of the crib like dancing and singing and hamming it up? I came (laughs) out of the crib hamming it up. (laughs) (laughs) Very cool. I would actually carpool to San Francisco to those acting classes um, on my own. Uh, I was super, super determined to get to those acting classes. That, that almost so, sounds like hitchhiking, not carpooling. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you're making my life sound so much more exciting than it is. <laughs> when and we, then I hitchhiked to acting class. <laughs> like, I, I, no. <laughs> no, we just scheduled, you know, carpools with other people in the class who had parents that drove or drove themselves. <laughs> well, when we when we write your life story, we'll, we'll option your biopic. <laughs> It'll be much better if you write it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, so what was the step to getting to the never-ending story? So um, it was a happy accident. I was in an acting class, and a casting agent, her name is Anna Gross, was in San Francisco looking to cast uh, somebody for the role, and she was friends with my acting teacher. 
So she wanted to have lunch and came to Fort Mason where the school is and happened to be a little bit early and saw the tail end of class and thought that I might make a, be a good person to audition and she invited me to audition. So um, it was really, and I had no idea what she was asking me to audition for, but I was, I still have some kind of issue with taking on too much and say, you know, always doing like a million projects. So mm -hmm. she was like, do you want to audition for this? And I was like, yes. Um, and uh, at the time I was in a, um, a traveling um, troupe that was kids that perform at local schools. Uh -huh. So um, that more the morning of the audition, I had ha I had a show, and I arrived like really disheveled, and <laughs> I was Piglet in a Winnie the Pooh show, so I had like pig makeup smeared all over my face, <laughs> and I was like, "I'm here for the audition." <laughs> and you were, and let's not, you were ten. I was ten. You, you know, this was like yeah, not even a teenager <clears throat> yet, out hitchhiking to gigs and auditions. <laughs> I mean, you know, so. With piglet makeup on, I mean, it, it, right. had, it had to be super cute. Maybe that's why you landed the gig, I mean, that's right? <laughs> <laughs> so what? how was that for you? Did you like auditioning as a child, or was it in an intimidating process for you? Or were you just like, because you were a kid, no fear kind of deal? I think that in some ways as a kid, you have less fear. I do think that. Like, you just, at least for me, um, I... I I just I just really love to be inside of stories, and I figured, um, you know, if I didn't get chosen, I'd just do another one. Like it was, <laughs> I didn't sure. really take it too hard. Um, and um, and I think I just got really lucky, and the material really resonated with me. I really identified with the character. I fell in love with her. And, and so, and so for sure, like by then there was an audition in San Francisco and then one in LA and then another one in Germany. And by the third one in Germany, I was really like, oh, I really want this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I got progressively more nerve wracking. Well, going into what became obviously such a, a immensely huge movie. I mean, at 10 years old, were you understanding the gravity of the movie when you're even in the audition process or getting into the characters to start out with? Um, you know, I don't think I totally understood the gravity of the movie. I think also my parents didn't understand the gravity of the movie. Partly it was filmed in Germany over the mm -hmm. summer. And it was sort of like, well, let's go take this fun summer vacation in Europe and you'll do this little European release and then we'll come home and no one will ever see it. That'll be great. And then, you know, you can do your next dance recital. Like, <laughs> we didn't really understand what we were doing. And then we were like, wow, this is really cool. Like, there's a lot of really big puppets here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't, I, and, and so, and maybe I was blessed to not know it really, because I just focused on the character and I really didn't have any expectations for it to be seen or, you know, become pop, you know, become sort of iconic in that way. Sure, and probably a blessing that social media didn't exist back then. I mean, because think about the 10-year-old today. They see so much and are exposed to so much that even a child actor, they probably have way more pressure today and just know too much. Everybody knows too much, <laughs> you it's know? It's a very different world. It really is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep, exactly. So being on set and, like you just mentioned, all of these animatronic puppets and all that type of stuff, what was, what impressed you the most, or what was your favorite character that you kind of fell in love with on set? I mean, I know everybody loves Falcor. He's, I was just but saying, he's alluding to Falcor. I'm a, well, everybody loves Falcor. <laughs> I didn't spend enough time with Falcor, which I, okay. I'm sad about. You know, the Empress and Falcor don't have like yep. a lot of scenes together, or mm -hmm. any, in fact, really. Yep. So I saw Falcor once as a head with the green screen behind uh -huh. uh, him, but I never saw like the whole thing. He was like in pieces whenever I saw him. Um, but the, for, for me, the, um, the, the, the whole, the bat, the rock biter, like that little enclave of puppets, yeah. mm -hmm. I was able to watch their scenes get filmed and I was able to watch the people move the levers on the side. And, um, and I love the fact that it was like a person and a puppet, like they sort of mixed the, the, the people together. 
Um, and I also sat, sat in on the Swamps of Sadness scenes, which mm. was completely amazing. And, you know, I was little, and so I walked into the tent, and I was like, Freer! Like, <laughs> just sank down into the mud. I was, like, trying to get over to the, like, side of the <laughs> huge swamp, you know? That must have been a very dirty film, film uh, <laughs> set. <laughs> It was really like there was so I mean the mud was so deep it was crazy. Wow. And you had the horse on set for that too, right? Then and Yeah. He wasn't um I'm so happy that they I wasn't around for that scene. I was watching the scene where uh Marla sneezes. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, because there would have been a lot of background noise if I had been watching the horse you just hear this sobbing child in the background <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like interacting with animatronics and puppetry and and those types of things i mean was it different for you than interacting did you feel the difference in your acting approach at that age like talking to a puppet versus talking to well that's a really interesting question i mean i think that in a way the never ending Story is an interesting film. I know that there's a real there's a, a, a difference between acting for film and acting for stage in the sense that you you want to make your gestures larger for stage. Body language is a lot more important for stage, and you want to be more subtle on film. But at the same time, it was really much more akin to theater than a lot of films are today, mm -hmm. in the sense that the set was real in the same way that you inhabit like a set on stage like everything was physically there and touchable whereas I've been on sets with green screens where you're imagining the whole thing and the director promises you that there's going to be a lot of people you're, you're, you're yeah. staring having a, 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 an in-depth conversation with a tennis ball on a stick yeah and you're like I hope they really fill this in you know <laughs> Wow, that's funny. Actually, I remember hearing um, Dee Wallace, who is the plays the mother in E.T., she talked about this very thing and how uh, Drew Barrymore, when uh -huh. she had to interact with E.T., how beneficial it was that E.T. was a real puppet because yeah. the children, on, especially for children on set, as an adult actor, you have a little bit more sense of what's going on and how to interact with things. But for the child, that children actors, uh, having that puppet on stage just makes a huge difference. And I think that's what's lacking from a lot of modern day films because yeah. so much is relied on uh, special effects and green screening and, and digital animation and all that stuff. So, For sure. I mean, I had a really good acting teacher uh, who always says that acting is, is 99% listening. So it's not how you're delivering your line. It's how you're responding to the line you were given. Mm -hmm. And I think that with a puppet, you're able to do that listening part. Whereas if, the thing is get filled in later um it's all like your choices and not so many like react reacting to other choices you know so it, yeah i think the dimension of things does get a little bit narrower but you know obviously there's also a really like 80s old-fashioned mm -hmm. like <laughs> you know there's definitely some beauty i think what's happening now is really cool because they're combining animatronics with cgi and there's a much better sense of like when to use what aspect and why. So you well, know, it's, like, it's almost a throwback. They're they're going back to the puppetry days and and practicality of actually having things in front of you. Yeah. Yeah, we got to send you a link. There, there was a gentleman we had on our podcast not too long ago, uh, David Bousquet, mm -hmm. who did a short film called The Lookouts, and they spent months. I don't know, year? Uh, I think it was a year. Creating this puppet and called the Basilisk and did this short film. And I mean, it's just shot so well and so beautiful. Oh, I really want to see that. Um, yeah, please do. I'll send you the links for that. And anybody that's, that's listening, listening in, it'll be in the it, yeah, comments. Yeah, it'll be in the show notes. So yeah, for sure, they can check it out. It, it, really impressive. And when we saw it, we it actually sparked a whole conversation for us about the never-ending story and Jim Henson, you know, all those movies. Never-ending movie. story, Dark Crystal. Dark These were Crystal. all things that came up when we were, after after we had the conversation with David, so. Exactly. Um, so what was it like working with all these young actors on set? Was it like Playland every day and just like, or was like... <laughs> Well, um, it, it was, we got along, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we were, you know, 
they were boys and I was a girl yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at age 10. You know what I mean? Like That's perfect. So I was very, um, I was all business. You know, I'd be like, bang, 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 bang. Does anyone want to go over their lines? You know, let's let's go over the scene. And like they'd ha- like Barrett would have like his little GI Joes and be like, let's play with these. And I was like, oh, <laughs> gives, you know, <laughs> that's so great. So, but I but I really liked them both. They were wonderful. Cool. And so, are they lifelong friends? Do you keep in touch no, with these folks no. at all, or? No, I mean, you know, I live in San Francisco and they lived in L.A. Mm-hmm. and I kind of dropped out of the acting circuit after the Neverending Story. So we didn't stay in touch. But um, but we we I have fond memories like we definitely got along and, you know, they were def- there was definitely times where I was like, oh, there's just boys. You know? <laughs> I'm sure I'm <laughs> sure oh, girls probably, you know, they probably felt that way about me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they were like, oh, we got to work with this girl. Yeah, you know, unless they were a little older and maybe thought you were cute or who knows. But, yeah, you know, it's one, <laughs> one of those things. Um, I have a, I, yeah, yeah. I have a funny story where Noah, um, we were at a, a German outdoor pub. There were these train tracks like next to the pub. There's pubs everywhere in Germany where the film was filmed. So mm-hmm. it's funny like we spent all of our time offset at pubs <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, beer, or beer gardens don't forget <laughs> it. <laughs> and my indiana jones parents <laughs> drinking at 11 in the pub uh, just hanging out there because that's where the camera people and the makeup people were um and uh the there was like a train really 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 far off and he was sort of playing this hero you know And so out of nowhere, he suddenly, like, grabbed me and, like, flung me across the railroad tracks into the bushes. And I was like, you know, what's going on? And he's like, a train is coming. And then we sort of had to wait for the train to sort of come. (laughs) He was rescuing you. Time, you know. And then I had to be like, thank you for saving me from that (laughs) pending danger. Oh, my God. Rescuing the damsel in distress. Yes. 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 It was sort of in slow motion. Oh, my goodness. So what was li- what is like life like these days for you? Um, you're a mother yourself now, and you you haven't you've acted in a few things, right? Um, mostly wh- live, mostly theater. Yeah, you've been doing mostly theater work. What was the last uh, production that you you were, you were in? Um, well, I founded a company called Paper Canoe Company with um, my husband. Actually, after the birth of my daughter, uh, I wanted to start making family theater again. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, not again, just The NeverEnding Story was sort of family-oriented. Mm-hmm. And for me, trying to bring all of my passions under one umbrella seemed really important. And I was a mom, and I wanted the stuff that I was making to relate to my kid and to my community. And I wanted to be my own boss, and I wanted all those things to kind of exist uh, together. So uh, we... we created um, two live shows in New York for that. The theater show, the more significant acting show would be Light, a Dark Comedy, Mm -hmm. uh, which was a story um, my husband wrote um, and had some um, collaboration with this ensemble theater company that we were working with. And Robert Ross Parker was another writer on it. Um, And it was a story about a world where uh, scientists with good intentions um, steals the sun and we were speaking about how everything's faster and go 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 and everyone knows too much so in this world people uh, initially stop dreaming stop sleeping they're always the lights were always on everyone was always working and always trying to be super productive and people lost the ability to to dream and relax so he created a, a slumber yard a center of and he took away the sun and then over time everyone just it, it sucked all the light away, and over time, everyone forgot the word light. So the vocabulary doesn't include the word light. It's called dim, and all the actors wore self-cranking machines with, like, headlamps and stuff, so we generated all our own light in the production. And uh, and this very curious little girl ends up saving the day and bringing the sun back. Cute. So where was where was that taking place? Where could we... 
So we started developing it through uh, the New Victory Theater, which is a Broadway playhouse. They gave us a residency, and we performed it at the Duke Theater um, in Manhattan. And then we did another incarnation at a Brooklyn playhouse called Triskelion. Um, and my vision for that project is to take it into a graphic novel um, and maybe even into a film because uh, the story would come alive on a graphic novel page yeah. even more so than I think the theater. But I think that was how I'm a creature of the theater. Live theater is my medium. So we kind of started in that world. But as we develop Paper Canoe, we're finding that we're more and more curious about diving into digital content. Cool. So our third project uh, is a digital project, and that's Beanstalk Jack, which is a folk rock album that we've been playing around and are also going to develop into a live show. But it's something that I can make some music videos for and um, explore a little more digital content. Well, you're a busy lady. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's so great. I mean, I think it's wonderful that, you know, you've taken the family-friendly content concept and knowing your background and really started developing your own content, especially now, you know, that you have a family of your own and things like that. So, and I think there's there's not a lot of um, content out there that has a certain innocence anymore. Like, The NeverEnding Story has this innocence to it. You know, even if they're making children's movies these days, they're making them with the adults in mind, and there's always... You don't see you don't see as many G-rated movies anymore. Like, yeah. I, I, I can't seem to remember even, like, was was Trolls that just came out or any of those things? Were they actually G-rated, or were they... And they, and they all have this, like, snide sort of, like, tongue-in-cheek I'm stuff. Love, I'm in love with those Pixar films. Like, yeah. I feel like finding nemo is like the perfect film yeah they you know, do a good job they, yeah they do a really good job i feel like they're able to cater to the kids but there's enough stuff in there for the parents that i mean there's definitely like i, I would sort of be like you know wanting to watch the newest pixar movie with my daughter and she doesn't want to and i'm sort of like well should i just sneak it on my own <laughs> <laughs> so um i mean i feel like that's the the kind of story that we want to tell is one that, I mean, E.T., for example, is a film that was made for children. And at the same time, like, it really holds up for adults. I, yeah. I think a, a good story does speak to different ages. And, I don't know, Stranger Things that's on Netflix Oh, I love now. that show. Like, love it. It's not really for kids, but it's it's about kids, and kids are watching it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so are adults, you know. I think there's something really interesting about mining material that uh, can really hit across a really broad uh, age range, and, and, and that powerful stories can do that. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I agree 100%. Yeah. And, and in the world that we're in, I mean, you know, we, we talk to a lot of filmmakers and a lot of actors and things like that. And I, I think the children's segment is one that not a lot of people are going after right now. So I, I you know, I, I applaud you. I think it's I think it's a good... Well, everybody's really looking good for the next, like, explosion and comic book hero guy, I mean, you know, so... Yeah, I mean, that's kind of why we did it. We sort of watched a bunch of things with our daughter and we the, the good stuff was really good but it ran out pretty quickly mm -hmm. and felt like there was a little bit of a deficit and that you know why not try to participate in that world and I do think that children's books were a little bit like that in the past like they were considered a sort of not very sexy area to be working in and then there was this kind of renaissance of children's books and all the best illustrators started illustrating these books and suddenly there was this recognition that all this creativity is possible within that genre and that medium so mm -hmm. i'm hopeful that um that they'll be more and more really interesting creative imaginative aesthetically beautiful uh storytelling for all ages yeah for sure i i, I think so i think that's i think that's something that's that could definitely happen um Tammy, I really appreciate you coming out and hanging with us today. This was a real treat for us. I know sure. I, I got a little giddy. It was good. <laughs> um, do you want to tell the folks where they can find you and your company and, and all the yeah. good, great content you're making? Yes. So if you're interested in what I'm up to, the best way to keep track of me is through my theater company, papercanoecompany.com. And I am on Twitter at NeverEndingTammy. Uh, so give me a shout out on that. And, um, and I do have some irons in the fire. I'm looking at some scripts and I am thinking about getting into 
some other acting gigs too. So I'll post all of that on Paper Canoe. Awesome. And if you want to check out the CD, the album that we just released, that's on Bandcamp under Beanstalk Jack. Okay, cool. Excellent. Well, we'll definitely check it out. Joe's got two youngins. Yes, I do. So he will he can go check them out. We'll, we'll, Dan's got a youngin Dan's too. Dan's got a youngin. <laughs> I, would, I always forget Dan has kids for some reason, but I don't know why. They forget about me all the time. <laughs> He's usually pretty quiet I, at the end I, of the I, table. I sit here quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Tammy. Thank you. Take care. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you.